within a couple of seconds. It's good to see everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, I have started a pad of paper on this end of the room. Uh, if you would just please put your name on it so that we have a track of attendance, uh, I would appreciate that. We have two weeks left in this class, and then we're going to start the, uh, the in-home studies on August 4th and a, a, a set curriculum that's going to go along with that. I understand that Jack Hoagland and Wes Autry will be teaching in here uh, starting the 12 weeks that start on August 4th. So that's what will happen here. There will do the in-home stuff going on here as well. So if you would turn with me to Mark chapter 8. We've been talking about these, these threads of thought, right? We've described them in lots of different ways. We've called them layers. We've called them threads. We've called them all kinds of different things, uh, mostly because I can't decide which one describes it the best. Uh, but the idea is we have these, these sections of text that, that flow, these thoughts that flow through Mark. We've looked at the I want stuff. We've looked at the concept of God, right? The reign and rule of God and how that flowed through the text. We've talked about uh, a number of things that we spent a few weeks looking at the parables that taught about the heart and how heart is a key word throughout the text. What have we argued is the key passage in Mark? Yeah, 8, close, not 31. Yeah, 8, 8 34 and 35. What happens, what's significant in chapter 8? What's, what's the key pivot in chapter 8? Peter's confession, right? Uh, who do you say that I am? And he says that Jesus is the Christ. And then Jesus starts, uh, gives them one of the, the three suffering statements. Remember, we talked about the three major suffering statements. Who can tell me where they are? 831, 931. And 33, 34. Uh, again, it would be easier if it was 1031, but it's not. But it makes it easy to remember. And so Peter says, you're the Christ. Then Jesus explains that the Christ is going to die, right? What's the problem with that for Peter? Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't fit Peter's preconceptions of Messiah. I mean, what is Peter thinking about Messiah? thinking about Messiah. Earthly kingdom, right? You're going to kick the Romans out. The Jews are finally going to be free. We're not going to be a captive people anymore. We get to reign and rule, uh, and it's going to be great. But Jesus has to teach them that that's not going to be the way it goes, right? And if you followed this class, the first eight chapters are trying to do what? Prove that Jesus is Christ gets you to the point where you understand that confession that Peter makes in, in chapter 8, that Jesus is the Christ. And how does Mark go about doing that? Miracles, right? Miracle, 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 miracle in chapters 1 through 2 from 8 to the end of the book. Explain what the Christ means, right? To... to clarify with them to change their mind about what they think the Christ is. They think earthly kingdom. He's telling them he's going to die. And so since it doesn't line up with Peter's preconceptions, what happens? What does Peter do it's immediately after he professes for Jesus to be the Christ? What does Peter do? He rebukes him. What does that tell us about G Peter understanding that Jesus is the Christ? He doesn't get it, does he? he? He verbally acknowledges the truth. He's putting the pieces together, but he doesn't see Jesus clearly, does he? If he really understood that Jesus was the long-awaited for Messiah, would he take him aside and rebuke him? Of course not, right? And so then we have the key teaching in the text, which is... Uh, 33, get behind me, Satan, right? He rebukes, G G Peter rebukes Jesus. He says, get behind me, Satan. You are not 
setting your mind on God's interest but man's. There's Peter's problem, isn't it? He's focused on what he wants and what he's been taught, not what God wants. What does God want? God wants the sacrifice of the Messiah so all men can be saved, right? Uh, and, and it's not just this, this uh, elevation of the Jews to power. There's a bigger plan here, but Peter's focused on man's interest, not God's. And we've talked about this throughout uh, the week. What we're going to do with these last two weeks, since we only have two left, originally we had a couple more, but we're going to condense things, is we're going to look at how this theme, how this concept of if anyone wants to come after me, they got to deny self, take up their cross and follow. How Mark uses that throughout the whole rest of the text of the Gospel of Mark. And since you all are reading through the Gospel of Mark in its entirety, in one sitting, every week between class, which I know you are because I've asked you to do that every week since we started, um, I want you to notice, especially in this week's reading, how the last eight chapters focus on this concept of deny self and what Mark is doing with this, okay? Some of the illustrations are going to be quite easy to, to follow and understand. For example, if you flip over to uh, 1017, we're not going to go through this text uh, in detail, but in 1017, you have the story of the rich young comes and says, what do, teacher, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And ultimately, Jesus tells him to obey the commandments. He says, I've already doing that. So what does Jesus tell him? Sell all your stuff. So is the command for us, if we want to be Christians, we've got to go sell all our stuff. How does this example of the rich young ruler fit into Mark's theme? What he's doing in this book? What is the point of the rich young ruler story? He has, to deny he has to deny himself the thing he really wants. What does he really want? His stuff. Welcome to America. I think this guy's American at some level. We like our stuff, don't we? And that's why it says in the text that he went away grieved, right? Because he owned much property. He likes his stuff. He likes his wealth. He wanted an attaboy. He wanted a pat on the back that says, hey, have you been keeping the commandments? He sat instead of rejoicing, even though he got the answer that he asked for. <clears throat> so there are some passages in Mark's gospel that are going to be really, really clear as to how they fit in uh, into this bigger picture. There's another one um, in chapter 12. Look at chapter 12, 41 to 44. This is the story of the, the widow who puts one mite into the treasury. Uh, and Jesus sat down across from the treasury and began observing how people were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which would amount to a cent. And calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. Why? For they all put in out of their surplus. Were they denying themselves if they're putting out of their surplus? No, but what did she put in? What does the text say? She put in out of her poverty. She put in all that she owned and all that she had to live on. Circle the word all. If you write in your Bible, I suggest you circle that word all. She gave everything. What's she an example of? Denying self, right? I mean, she trusted enough to give God everything. Now look at the paragraph just before that. Verse 38. In his teaching, he was saying, Beware of the scribes and Pharisees who like, or the scribes, sorry, who like to walk around in long robes and they like the respectful greetings in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at the banquets who devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers. They don't do it because they're connecting with God. They just want everybody to see how careful they are. Receive greater condemnation. Why is that here? What's Mark doing? What are they an example of? Refusing to deny self. 
So throughout the text, and, and when you study, it's really important. I, one, of the, one of the key things that I've learned, and if I could share it with everybody, I would be so happy, is one of the key things I've learned about studying Scripture is to always ask yourself the question, why is what I'm reading here? I don't mean why is it in the Bible. I mean, why is it in this position, particular book? What did he just say or what has he been talking about? And how does what I'm reading fit what he's been talking about? What is this flow of thought? What is the context that I'm reading this in? Now, if you go back to chapter 8, and we'll, we'll go through more of these over the coming, we may even get to another one tonight, depending on how much time we spend. But sometimes it's real easy. It's easy to see that the widow is an example of, of giving everything, right? The text says she gave everything she had. She's denying herself. She's giving it all to God. That one's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to look at the scribes and say, they just like the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. They're showing off for the people they want everybody to pat them on the back and say how spiritual they are. They're not denying themselves. When you see passages like the disciples arguing amongst themselves, who, which one of them is the greatest? Good example of not denying self, right? They're, they're arguing. But I want you to look at chapter 9. As we, we finish the, this key section... The, the key statement in the book, 34 and 35, he, he goes on and, and we, we see chapter 9. Now, what happens when you see that big 9 at the beginning of chapter 9? What does it do to you? It frustrates me too. I, I, I would agree with that. But what does it do to us mentally? It's on to something else. Yeah, it's on to something new. How does chapter, what's the first word in chapter 9? And. What does that tell you? He is not on to a new thought. As a matter of fact, if you read verse 38, what should be happening is, for whoever is ashamed of me and my word in his adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the He stays late and he keeps on going, right? So do me a favor. When you see that big chapter number, do your best to ignore it, at least at because that really is the transfiguration. has got to be a connection, doesn't there? So read with me as we go through. We're in verse 2. It just happened that we were just talking about at the end of chapter 8 with what I just read so far. Who's the connection? Jesus. <laughs> you pretty much say that throughout Mark's gospel. Who else? Peter. Peter was the key guy end of chapter 8, right? He's the one that made the confession. He's the one that rebuked Jesus. He's the one that Jesus called Satan. He was the key character, and he's on the Mount of Transfiguration with James and John. So there's a flow of thought, and as a matter of fact, when you do your reading this week, I want you to notice how much the second half of this book emphasizes Peter. As a matter of fact, next week, we're going to close this class by looking at the last two chapters of this book. I'm going to give you a little highlight, a little preview. The last two chapters of this book contrast Peter with Jesus. It's a really interesting connection that where he follows Peter's activities and Jesus' activities almost in parallel. Okay, uh, But Peter is a significant character not only throughout the whole Gospel of Mark, but especially in the second eight chapters. And so Peter's on the Mount of Transfiguration with James and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them. And it explains what, how he was transfigured. His garments became radiant and exceedingly white as no launderer on earth could whiten them. I, I always like the way Mark said that. It's almost like a soap commercial. He's actually shining. 
uh, those words mean to, to, to beam. I, I mean, those, that idea is he's actually giving off light. It's not just that his clothing is so white. He's actually shining physically. And Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said, <laughs> there's our guy, right? And what does Peter say? What's Peter want to do? Build three tabernacles. What does that tell us about what Jesus is, or what Peter's thinking? He wants to build one for Elijah, one for Moses, one for Jesus. Yeah, they're equals, aren't they? They each deserve a tabernacle. Didn't he just profess Jesus to be the Christ, the Messiah, the long-awaited-for Messiah? What does that tell us about Peter's thinking? He doesn't quite get it. He's given the right answers, but he still doesn't quite get it. And he offers to build three tabernacles. He, he tells Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. You think? I, talk about, sometimes Peter just puts his foot in his mouth. I think I relate to Peter more than anybody else in Scripture. Because uh, there's times when I'm just dumb. I just put my foot in my mouth, right? And he's like, it's good for us to be here. You think? There's some Elijah and Moses. The other question that I'm always asked is, how did they know it was Elijah and Moses? We're not going to get into that. Were they wearing name tags? Did I, you know, did they did, did they look like their baseball card? I don't. What is it? I. But the text tells us that it was Elijah and Moses, right? And Peter says, "It's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles: one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah." Notice verse 6, for he did not know what to answer. I didn't know what to say, so I just offered to build something for everybody. Point is, Peter's still confused, isn't he, about who Jesus really is and what all this means and how all this is really going to work. He's, he's sacrificed a lot. He knows a lot more than he did at the beginning, but he still doesn't have a clear vision of how this is going to play out. And so what happens on the mount? We know, we're familiar with this account. What does is, what is the text say in verse 7 happens? Yeah, there's a cloud and a voice. And what does the voice say? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And what happens when the voice says that? Verse 8 tells us. When they looked around, who's left? Jesus. Where did Elijah and Moses go? They're gone. So what is the emphasis of this account of the transfiguration? What is the, the main point? This is my son. Listen to him. What, do, what are Elijah and Moses doing here? Okay, um, actually, if you look at Luke's account, we're not going to chase that. Uh, if you look at Luke's account, they were actually discussing in Luke chapter 9, verse 31, it says they were talking about his departure that he was about to accomplish from Jerusalem. It's very interesting. Um, uh, so, but Mark doesn't give us that information, but you can follow Luke chapter 9 and get a little bit more information about that. Okay. I agree. It, it puts them aside. But who are Elijah and Moses? I mean, to, there you go. So Elijah represents the prophets. Moses represents the law. So what's God telling Peter? Okay, okay. pointing them toward the Messiah. What? Okay, so, so the Old Testament's going away, isn't it? This is a, in, in some ways, at its very core, this is a communication to the disciples that the Old Testament is, is ending. The Law and the Prophets are, are going away. Jesus has more authority than the Law and the Prophets. And the Law and the Prophets are going to be done away with. And so listen to my son. And Elijah and Moses vanish. 
What on earth does that have to do with deny self, take up your cross and follow? Go ahead. Okay, we absolutely have to listen to him to follow him, right? If we're going to follow him, we've got to pay attention to what he said. But in the context, what's the problem? Who, who's, who's struggling in this context? Peter. Why? Why is he struggling? Huh? Okay, he's not listening. I think he is listening. I mean, he, he, he said, you're the Christ. I've put that together. As, Matthew, as a matter of fact, Matthew's account says it's my father that's revealed that to you. Mark doesn't include that information, but Matthew's account does. Um, I don't think God whispered to Peter, but he saw the miracles. So, I don't know if you could hear her, but I, she's spot on. Think about the Jews. Was this easy for the Jews? We've been looking at a word that appears over and over in the text. It's a word that is often translated understand. And I've, I've explained to you that that word, often that word in this text, is this ability to grasp something that challenges your thinking and practice. Does this challenge the thinking and practice of the Jews? First of all, the concept of Messiah is being challenged. But what is Peter being told he's got to put away? Why? Okay, it's going to be done away with, but he's got to deny himself. But think of the baggage that Peter's carrying. Why is he struggling with this? this concept of Messiah and what it really is going to be. Where did he get the idea from? From the law of the prophets, right? I mean, everything Peter's ever been taught about Messiah is earthly kingdom coming into power, uh, kicking out the wrong, I mean, his whole life. And we don't know exactly how old Peter is here. Uh, I've heard a, a variety of ranges, but it really doesn't matter. Within Peter's lifetime, what has been told about Messiah? Messiah, Jesus. He says, you're him. And now what's God telling him? You got to deny yourself your heritage. You got to deny yourself the baggage that you bring to the voice of, of Jesus. Isn't that Peter's problem? He's bringing all kinds of preconceptions about Messiah with him to the discussion. He's bringing everything he's ever been taught from the time to a grasshopper, as Corey Sawyers would probably say. And Jesus is saying, you got to get rid of all of that. And God's saying, this is my son. Listen to him. How often do we bring baggage to the text when we study things? How often do we bring preconceptions? How often do you hear people say things like, my God would never. Isn't that a preconception? A loving God would never fill in the blank. Isn't that a preconception? Instead of going to the text and doing what? What did God just say? The word means? What does the word here mean? Okay, understand. Yes, hear and act on it. What, Denny? Yeah, hear and obey, literally. The, the word is actually translated obey some places in our New Testament. The, uh, the concept of this original language word is not just hear what I say. It's here in order to do it. Here in order to, to take it in. Here in order to put it into action, right? There's an obedience component to this word. And he says, this is my beloved son. Obey him. Listen to him. Who's Peter obeying right now? Okay. 
I would, I would agree with that. He's obeying the law. And the, or is he really obeying the law and the prophets? Or is he obeying his interpretation of the law and the prophets? Is there a difference? There is, isn't there? I, I mean, we can read this text and come up with our own interpretations, our own designs, and we can follow those interpretations. But are we necessarily listening to God when we do that? Not if we bring all this baggage with us, right? Not if we bring all these preconceptions about what God will and won't do, what the culture tells us God will and won't do, and, and all of those things. In some ways, Peter has to deny not only what the Law and the Prophets said, but his interpretation of the Law and the Prophets. He's got to be teachable. They all have to be teachable. Do we? Do we need to be teachable? How, I mean, I, if you're uncomfortable about this, don't raise your hand. How many of you here came from a, a, a denominational background outside of the churches of Christ? I'm, I've got my hand up too. I'm not just doing that. You can put your hands down. How hard was that? Why is that so hard? What's Peter got to do here? He... The whole Jewish system has to unlearn what they've been taught. Literally, for a lot longer than the 40 years or so that Peter's been alive. I don't know how old Peter is. Maybe he's in his late 20s. Maybe he's in his mid-40s. Who knows? But he, he's got to unlearn everything he's been taught. I found that really challenging when Lynn and I were studying with Don Cantor some 27 years ago now. Um, I, that was hard for me. I went to every study with all these preconceptions about my salvation and about my condition before God and what I knew about Scripture and what I knew about Jesus and what I knew about God. And when, when Cantor would point me at the text, what was my responsibility? What did I have to do that God just told them to do on the top of the mountain? Listen. To him, listen, get rid of all that junk that you're bringing with you. Stop listening to yourself. Stop li listening to your rationalization of, of how all this works. And listen to the text. It's a challenge, isn't it? And it all, what does, what's implied with that then? If, if our responsibility is to listen to the text, then what do we have to do? We got to do what it says once we understand it. But we got to deny ourselves all of that junk that we bring. We got to sit down and say, God, teach me. We got to sit down and say, I'm listening. What do you want from me? And I'm going to try the best I can to leave everything that I think I know behind. I'm going to put Denny on the spot a little bit. He told me a story years ago, and it stuck with me ever since. And this is probably 15 or 20 years old. He was studying with a denominational fella. And he was struggling. The guy was just stuck in his, his mindset. Denny was doing everything he could. Couldn't get the guy to really listen to what he was saying in the text. Or listen to what the text was saying, I should say, to be more accurate. And Denny said he, he challenged him with this question. If God was trying to teach you something different then you already think you know. Would you hear him? I kind of probably butchered that a little bit, but the concept is still there. If God was trying to tell you something through the pages of the scriptures that doesn't line up with what you currently believe, would you hear God's voice in the pages of scripture? Or would you carry your bags with you and say, I'm sorry, I know I read that. How often do we, I read commentaries, denominational commentaries that crack me up. I'll turn to Acts 2.38 and they will start out with, be careful. It sounds like this is saying you've got to be baptized to be saved, but it can't mean that. Really? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Sounds to me like that's what that means. And they'll say, I know it sounds like that, but it can't mean... Aren't they bringing baggage? True. Nothing. 
I pray that what I'm doing in this class is pointing you to the script. We've got to be willing to listen. We've got to be willing to take the baggage away. So what are, what's the challenge of that? I mean, Dee mentioned it a little bit. We've got to unlearn some things. That's, that's probably the biggest one, and that describes... problem with that okay we are comfortable even though doesn't it seem like carrying around a lot of stuff with us is, should be uncomfortable uh, I, I mean at some level but we are comfortable why are we comfortable with that and we don't have to learn we don't have to work do we? I mean I don't really have to examine scripture I know what it's telling me I know who Jesus is I know who God is redemption i know i know i know i know the doctrines you know i i, I can re recite the biggies you know no instruments we know women's role we got the proper view of instrumental music i'm not i don't really have to study my bible i already know it is that a dangerous position have any of you learned anything new in the last six weeks in this class in looking at the gospel of mark and don't if if you didn't don't shake your head no <laughs> Let me have my baggage. <laughs> but when we take the time to examine the text more deeply, don't we learn new stuff? And sometimes doesn't it challenge our practice? And I think so many times it also makes you understand that you don't have to learn everything. Yeah. You don't have to How much did the Jews look up to Elijah and Moses? I mean, those are the biggies, aren't they? I, I mean, we call Elijah one of the major prophets. It's not because, it, it, but he was a big shot, Moses, right? I mean, the only other person you could throw in this that would be that big would be maybe Abraham, right? These, these are the biggies for the Jews. And what's God saying? Put them away. Stop listening to them uh, as far as doctrine goes. How hard is it us to put away grandma or, or a teacher that we had that, that taught us when we were younger or, or some spiritual mentor? How many of us have taught people the gospel and sometime during the study we've heard, well, my grandmother or my grandfather was the most spiritual person I have ever known in my life. And if what you're telling me is true, they're lost. They're lost. It, does what grandma or grandpa did or taught matter to what this says? I mean, if we're really going to listen to this, that may have implications. But that's, let's face it, that's hard. And how many people does that sometimes keep from obeying the gospel? I've got people in my own family that have told me straight out, I have, a, you know, if what you're saying is true, that means someone I love and care about that I respected and thought of as a very spiritual person isn't faithful and isn't, and I'm, I'm just never going to accept that. And they're not going to heaven, which hurts your heart. for me it is easier for me uh, it's comforting to me but is it better for me I mean why didn't Jesus just say ah Peter never mind you're right about Messiah it's okay he made him change didn't he you know I there's a there's a concept in our culture that that is you do you anybody heard that before just you do you. Is that a good, good? Did Jesus say, Peter, it's okay. You just, you do you. Is that what he's telling Peter? God, from a voice from a cloud, by saying, 
this is my son, listen to him, said, you got to put all that heritage away. You got to get rid of everything that you've been taught. You've got to put aside family. Did Peter have grandmas and grandpas who were faithful Jews? Probably. Had he been taught from grandma and grandpa about Messiah and all? Maybe. Certainly had teachers that taught him. And what's God saying? You can't carry that baggage. You have to listen in order to obey. And you got to listen to my son. Guys, when we approach God's word, do we come to listen? Or do we come for me to do me? Because we like to carry the baggage. We like to bring our preconceptions. We, we like to think we already know how it all works. And as a result, we neglect our studies, don't we? I'm going to argue with you. One of the reasons why we aren't better Bible students sometimes, well, I, let me ask it instead of tell you. I'll see, if you, see what you think. Why are we not better Bible students sometimes? Okay, first we think we know it. What happens if we don't know it? And I look at this book. It's going to convict us. It's an old saying about stomping on people's toes. Anybody like to have your foot stomped on? I'll be honest with you. Scripture does it every time I look at it. I, I mean, James has an illustration, and you knew it was coming. I don't want to hear any cripes and complaints. You knew it was coming. James has an illustration about a man looking at his natural face in the mirror the mirror there is God's word, the word of truth. And this man looks into that mirror and he sees exactly who he is. Nothing hidden. He sees his, the face of his origin is the way you could retranslate that. No masks. When we look at God's word, God. He shows you your flaws. He shows you your sins. He shows you your shortcomings. And he says, change them. And James says it's like a man who looks at a natural face in the mirror and walks away and forgets what kind of man he was. It's kind of like when you got spinach in your teeth and you see it in the mirror, but you don't clean it out and you walk away. Do you remember you got spinach in your teeth? You don't, do you? Until somebody goes, um, you got spinach. And then you're offended because like, what are you, you, you judging me? No, you just got spinach in your teeth. But isn't that kind of the baggage that we bring? Some, isn't that what Peter's doing? God said, look in my word and see the truth. But that means you've got to strip away all the masks. You've got to strip away all the heritage. You've got to strip away all you've been taught. You've got to approach God's word with a what? Well, last week, what have we been talking about? Not a hardened heart, but a softened heart. They can be molded and shaped by God, not molded and shaped by your preconceptions, not molded and shaped by your, the teachings of your grandma or grandpa, necessarily, not molded by your ideas of how God works and how God doesn't work. But you've got to approach your, the text and say, God, shape me. God, teach me. Harder. God, change me. Do we like change? We hate it. Unless it's our idea, right? But is that following? Or is that late? Because that's the other part of the command, isn't it? It's not just the deny self. What's Peter got to do? Get rid of the heritage, get rid of the baggage, listen, and then do what? take up his cross, put himself to death, Luke says daily in his account, and follow. Don't lead. How much time do we spend following? And how much time do we spend leading? Not am I. I'm telling God what I believe him to be. I'm making God in my own image. 
Am I not? Or making my family's image or my previous teacher's image or some relative or relation that taught me and was so spiritual and I looked up to them as a spiritual role model and I made God into that image. That's what God's all about and I don't listen to what God has said. It's hard. Change is hard. Being molded is hard. You know, when we used to throw pots, we would get the clay out of the bag and when you first get it out of the bag, it's a little cold. Anybody... Anybody throw pots or work with clay before? When you first get it out of the bag, it's kind of cold. What? How's it feel? Yeah, it's clammy, but it's still pretty stiff, isn't it, when you first take it out? And we used to punch it. <laughs> we, would, we would put it on the table and just you just knead it and bang on it. and You warm it up and you keep working it, and guess what? It gets softer and softer and softer. Isn't that the heart we need to bring to God? Is one that's ready to be shaped into what God wants to shape us into? Instead of us going to the text and shaping ourselves into the, God into the image we want Him to be in. He says, we got to listen to Him. And so, <clears throat> he, he tells them, this is my son, listen to Him. As we move through the text, we, we struggle with this concept among the disciples. The, the very next section is a section where a man brings a, a child to the disciples. He actually is bringing them to Jesus, but Jesus is up on the mountain, right? And the boy has a demon, and what's the problem? Do you remember? The disciples couldn't cast it out, right? And there's this big argument at Jesus and Peter and James and John are down off the, the mountain. They're, they're, there's this argument going on and the father explains that the child has had this demon since he was little and the, the uh, demon throws him into the fire uh, and into the water, verse 22, trying to destroy him. Uh, and he... Jesus asked the boy, the, uh, the father asked Jesus to cast the demon out, and Jesus asked, and what's the problem with the disciples? What do, what do they ask Jesus finally in verse 28? Why couldn't we do it? What does he say? What does he say in verse 29? What's the answer? This kind only comes out with prayer. How does this fit the theme? I mean, this is a challenging passage, isn't it? What does it mean that this kind only comes out with prayer? What does that mean? Uh, one account does, yeah. Mark does it. Okay. How is it self-denial? What do they need to deny themselves? Oh, the fasting part, you mean? Yeah, I, I could see that. But I think prayer is the major emphasis. In Mark's account, it's the only emphasis. What's the problem? They want to do it. Do they have the power? No. They, did they think they had the power? What do they need to do? So, so, what's our, what's our theme? They got to deny that they don't have the power, right? Do you see how when we find these contextual threads, we start things, puzzle pieces start getting put into place. They, they thought that they had the power, but that's what this word prayer is. This word literally means a petition addressed to deity. They needed to appeal to God in order to get this done, and they didn't. They thought they had the juice, and they even say, why could we not drive it out? Because you don't have the power. Deny yourself that position. Trust in God. Let God work. How often do we trust in our own power? Our, our power to understand, 
our power to figure all this out, to reason through things. We looked last week at a word uh, in Mark chapter 7 about that idea of evil reasonings, right? The way we think through things sometimes is evil. Why? What makes our reasoning What makes, what, in that context that we talked about last week, I know it's been seven days ago, what makes our reasonings evil? Not having them founded in what God's will is, right? I mean, that, that whole concept was thinking through things on our own. Aren't we good at that? Look at how smart we are. We can figure this out. I don't even need my Bible. I can figure out how God works all by myself. Can't I? Isn't that the way the world thinks? Is I can figure it out for myself? I can just look at the world and figure it all out and I'm right. I can reason my own way. What do they have to do? Deny themselves. Listen. Do it his way. Same thing with the disciples. And as we continue to move through the text, look at verse 34. So, they couldn't, I, I mean, this, this always shocks me. They couldn't cast out the demon. Those that cast out the demon. We're trusting in your own power instead of God's power. You needed to appeal, appeal to God. And as they're walking along, verse 33, they came to... What were you discussing on the way? And what were they discussing? Which one of them is the greatest? Are they listening to deny self, take up your cross and follow? They're still jockeying for position. How many of you are watching the TV show, The Chosen? Is anybody watching it? Only a few people in here. I, I recommend it. I, it's doing a couple of weird things these last couple of episodes. But there, one of the things it does is it shows this tension among the 12, I, you know, let's face it, when you put a tax collector, a zealot, and fishermen all together, I mean, those, those people probably didn't hang out together much on their own. The zealot wanted to kill the tax collector. The tax collector thought he was doing right by working for Rome, and the fishermen owed the tax collector money. They probably didn't get along, and The Chosen has really done a cool job of showing how these guys are trying. Jesus, but there's this little bickering and this little, you know, kind of jabbing at each other the whole time. And here's an example. Which one of them is the greatest? So what's the answer to the question? Which one of them is the greatest? Jesus. Are they carrying baggage? Are they bringing stuff to the table? They're still jockeying for power. They're still jockeying. Why? What good's power going to do them? And as a matter of fact, just a little later on, if you flip down uh, just a, a little while later in the text, when we get to, where is it? James and John. Chapter 10, verse 35. So they were arguing with each other about which one of them was the greatest. In chapter 10, verse 35, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said, We want you to do for us whatever we ask you to do. Does that sound like they're denying self? And what do they ultimately ask for? Power, right? Influence. One of us to sit on your right, one of, and what does Jesus tell them? First of all, you don't know what you're asking. That was probably the best answer in Scripture, wasn't it? What do they think they're asking for? Power and influence. What is it going to mean to sit at his right and left hand? Persecution and death. Isn't it? As you, can you drink the cup that I, I drink? And he eventually tells them, you will drink the cup that I drink, but it's not the cup you think it is. It's not inside. What are they doing? 
They're bringing all of this baggage, all of this heritage, all of this concept of Messiah with them, and they're not listening. Over and over again, you remember in chapter 8 when they're in the boat, Jesus said, are you still so hard of heart? Do you not yet see and understand? And the answer is that they don't. The question is, do we? Isn't that really the question? Is do we see any clearer than the disciples do sometimes? Or do we think we know so much? We think we, we've got it so wired that we don't even have to study Scripture. We don't have to listen to God's voice in Scripture. We know what this is all about. We're members of the Church of Christ. We're sound. Are we? If we're not listening? <laughs> and how much baggage do each one of us individually bring when we come to the text? Can't we find ourselves in the exact same position that Peter and James and John and all the others that we're going to see as we move through this text? Listen to him. There's a lot packed into that statement. It's not just the doing away of the old covenant. It's the doing away of Peter's entire history, his entire culture. More than that, it's doing away with his entire mindset. And he's got, God will say the same thing to us that he said to them, wouldn't he? This is my son. Listen to him. Follow him. Stop following yourself. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow. Next week, as we, we approach the crucifixion, we're going to see a, a, a point in chapter 14 that becomes critical. When we look at chapter 14, we look at Jesus in the garden. Jesus goes off to pray. What do the disciples do? They sleep. And what does Jesus tell them when he comes back? Look at, look at verse 38. He tells them to keep watch. But what is, what's the point that he makes? Okay, to avoid temptation. We'll talk about that a little bit next week. But then what does he say? Why? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Does that describe us? We want to follow, but do we? Or do we follow our flesh? Do we keep all that baggage? All of that mindset, all of that heritage, all of that junk that we carry with us to the text... Are we willing to submit ourselves to God and recognize that it means we've got to change? We've got to put down that baggage, no matter how painful that can be. And it can be really painful. But if we're going to truly listen to God, we've got to put all that aside, don't we? We sometimes look at the text and we think, those Jews were just idiots. Don't we? They had Jesus right in front of them, and they didn't even recognize it. Do we recognize how hard it was for them to change? How hard it was for them to put away centuries of heritage and centuries of mindset? I don't think we do, because we've been holding on to ours a lot shorter time than they have, and we won't let go of ours either, <laughs> will we? Some of us hold on to certain concepts our whole life and and even when presented with the clear truth of Scripture, say, I know what that says, but I don't believe that. Are we listening? Are we denying ourselves? Are we following? Or are we leading? Guys, that's the question of Christianity, isn't it? That's the question each one of us has to ask and answer in our own life. Are you following? Or are you leading? Are you listening, or do you think you already know? And are you looking to God for the answers, or do you already have them? I think that's the challenge that we all have to ask ourselves, and we all have to, 
to examine how much time are we spending listening to him? How much time in our week is, is focused around listening to the words of God so that it can guide us and direct us? And how much time and everything? It's a serious problem and it's a serious challenge. Why don't we close with a prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity challenges my toes every time I study it and teach it. And uh, I, I pray, as hard as that is, that it maybe challenges some other people's feet in the room as well, that we all might examine ourselves in the pages of Scripture, that we m all might look to find those, those the baggage that we bring to the text and, and get rid of it and come to you with clean hearts, honest hearts, seeking to be taught, seeking to learn from you, listening to your voice, not our own. Father, there are so many voices in our world that seek our attention. Uh, there's so many uh, schools of thought and there's so many opinions and, and uh, voices that try to lead us and try to guide us and try to influence us. And, and to put effort and energy and time into hearing your voice every day so that you might guide our life, so that we may follow instead of lead. From our own bootstraps, all of those concepts that, that we've heard since we were little kids, we, we recognize that we can't do us. I can't do me. I have to do you. And Father, in order to do that, I have to hear you. And I have to listen to your voice. And as hard as that is, Father, I pray that you help me and help all of us to listen with hearts that want to serve, that listen with hearts soft enough that you can mold us into the people that you would have us be, that that baggage would drift away, and that we can see you for who you really are and see ourselves for what we can be through your eyes rather than our own. Father, help us as we leave this place to be mindful of those things, not just while we're here at the building, but as we walk in this world, as we go about our daily lives, direct our steps each and every day. Help us to, to be guided by your word. Help us to listen. I thank you for the opportunity that I have to teach. I pray that all of this helps each one of us to be the people that you would have us be. It's through your Son, the Christ, 